Not everything is black and white. A lot of things are great. And we need to use our wisdom, our understanding, and the knowledge that God gives to us to be able to determine which way do we go? What am I supposed to do? You know? Your child is an addict. And you really feel that sense that I've got to kick this guy out. You know, he's more than 21 and he's not shaping up. What are you supposed to do? Huh? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Hanging there with the person. Hey, Kyla's got her hand up. All right, what? Yeah. Huh? Three hats and then three hat, or else ship out. No. Okay. I'm sorry. He was distracting me. <laughs> we rehab and support, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at this because last time, last Sunday, we passed through a passage that says that where Jesus says, "Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest." And so today, the title of the message is "Rest in Jesus." We need to find that rest. And how do we find that rest? And and what are we trying to rest from? We want to answer those questions. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. Now here you are. Let's imagine that you're with the disciples and you're walking down this grain field and you're hungry. Man, I'm hungry. I haven't had breakfast. I haven't had lunch. And it's the Sabbath. It's a day of rest for the Jews. So you're walking through the grain fields and you see this grain, maybe some corn or something that you can just pluck and you don't need to cook, you can eat that. And so Jesus is with you, he's at the head of the, the, the trail. And verse two, here are some Pharisees who are walking and looking at what Jesus is going to do and what the disciples are going to do. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And here you are, you're with the disciples and you're picking some grain, or corn, and you're already eating. And here are the Pharisees, and here are the teachers of the law, and they say, Look, your disciples, no, no, they didn't say you and your disciples. It says your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. So apparently Jesus was not picking grain. Well, he could last the whole day, right? Being hungry, knowing that he probably lasted 40 days and 40 nights without eating and drinking, right? So he knows what it's like. Uh, but disciples, and you happen to be there, you're just hungry. Your, your stomach is grumbling and saying, I need food, I need food. But the Pharisees say, hey, you guys are doing something wrong on the Sabbath. And it's supposed to be a day of rest. Verse 3, he answered, haven't you read, and this is Jesus saying, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? So what did David do? Yeah. He and his warriors, they got hungry, and the only food that was available was what? The showbread, the consecrated bread in the house of God. They went inside the house of God, took the showbread or the consecrated bread, and verse 4, this was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests, and they ate the consecrated bread. Now, according to the Old Covenant, that's taboo. We don't do that. But, what did God say? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Huh? Mercy triumphs over judgment. 
He didn't raise it up. It was not an issue for that. It was a non-issue. Verse 5, Or haven't you read in the law that the priest on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? So, the law says that on the Sabbath everyone should rest. Well, there happens to be um, a continuous 24-day 24, 24 work that happens in the temple. And so, these priests and Levites, they come into the temple and they still work on the Sabbath. And what does Jesus say? You know, they go inside, they work, and yet they're not held accountable for doing that because what's more important? Verse 6, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Here's the temple, here are the priests, but who's greater than the temple? He's insinuating now as to who is greater than the temple. Verse 7, if you have known what these words mean, and this is the words that we want to focus on today, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Can you say that with me? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, I've read this, the, the New Testament over and over and for a long time I didn't even know what that meant. God wants mercy, but not sacrifice. And yet the scripture also says that we should lay down our lives for each other. And the Old Covenant says that we should offer our sacrifices. Isn't that a conflict? Now we might say, no, there's no conflict, but for some people, when they look at that, there seems to be some kind of conflict here. Now, let's resolve that. He says in verse 8, now let's go back to verse 7, the second part of that. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and if you understood that, you would not have condemned the innocent. Now they were condemning the disciples and you know, all those people. And we'll find later on in verses 9 to 14, they were condemning someone else too. Verse 8, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, this is a like a parallel. He says that someone greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple is here. So when he says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, he's saying the Son of Man is greater than the Sabbath. Son of Man, who happens to be human, we're not even talking about the Son of God, we're talking about the Son of Man, is greater than the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath, so He tells, He tells us, He tells everyone, He tells the Jews, what can be done and cannot be done. And it's amazing that when we study this, that the Sabbath has nothing to do with the 24 hour period that the Old Covenant stipulates. Old Covenant says the Sabbath is Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. But when we get to the New Covenant, it's no longer talking about the day. Now, I'm sure you know the answer to this because um, we've gone through the changes in the Worldwide Church of God. Um, but it's also good to look at this in a fresh new light. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Can you tell your neighbor that? Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. <clears throat> what that means is the Sabbath is lesser than Him. He is greater than the Sabbath. Now, if you go back to Matthew 11, the last three verses there, Matthew 11, verse 28, He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Can you say that with me? Rest. rest. What is the Sabbath about? Rest. rest. Right? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'm going to give you the rest that you need. Now, it's unfortunate that the last three verses of Matthew 11 is not attached to Matthew 12. So the guys who decided to split these uh, scriptures into different chapters and into different verses, 
then realize what they just did. They, they made us look at one chapter and forget to look at the previous three verses. And so now we, we forget to, to connect the last three verses of chapter 11 with chapter 12. We should connect because in the original, there are no chapters and no verses. Right? There's no division. They should be connected. So he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Hey, all right, why would I need a yoke? I'm already under a yoke burden. Why do I need another yoke? He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am what? Gentle and humble in heart. The Lord of the Sabbath is gentle and humble in heart. The Pharisees who wanted to lord it over the people, they were not. They were not gentle, they were not humble. Verse 30 and last part of verse 29, and you will find rest for your souls. Again, that word rest. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now what does that mean? Huh? You won't put a heavy burden? Now, the imagery is with oxen. It's about oxen pulling a cart. Or an oxen pulling a... What do you call that? When you, when you try to kill the land? Um, the plowshare. The plow, alright? So when you match this smaller ox with a bigger ox, the yoke is for that for that new that newbie is going to be what? It's going to be easy in life. He's being trained. Now we're in a training situation with God. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is training us. We might go through difficult times. It may be very burdensome for us. But when we're yoked with Jesus, He carries the burden. That's why it's easy and it's light. Now we walk alone without Jesus and without the Holy Spirit, it's going to be hard and heavy. Right? Who wants to have a heavy burden? You don't want that. We want a light and easy burden, right? A light and easy yoke. And if we're yoked with Jesus, then it's going to be light and easy. <clears throat> Now Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now if you look at the story, here are the disciples, they're picking grain. And the Pharisee says, well you shouldn't do that. It's against the law. But Jesus says, yeah it's alright to do that. It's better for them to eat and not go hungry during the Sabbath than it is for them to just buy by the rules and regulations and tradition. So when we look at the word, I, the phrase, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, it means that God rather prefers people, wants to serve people, is more interested in people than He is about rules, regulations, and traditions. So people for God are more important than rules, regulations, or traditions. That's what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Sacrifice is a word for the law, the rules, the regulations, the sacrifice in the temple. But mercy is the relationship between God and His people, His children. So, what we learn here is that God desires for us to have mercy. That's what He wants. He wants us to have a relationship with Him in such a way that we receive that mercy from God and we extend the same mercy to others. He wants us always to look at people and desire mercy for everyone around us. Whether they be 
older people or younger people or children, whether they be black or white or yellow or green. Green, there's no green race, right? <laughs> he is more interested in people. While we tend to be more interested in our rules and regulations, we, we prefer the rule of law. Sorry, but that's what the Constitution says, right? We prefer the rule of law. God prefers mercy. God is more interested in serving people, loving them. We'll see that in verses 9 to 14. Verse 9, going on from that place, Jesus went into their synagogue. Now, in the Jews, in the Jewish culture, they had a synagogue. And that's where they went. Every Saturday, they would go to the synagogue. Our tradition is to go to church on Sundays. This would be our synagogue. Now, going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. Where would Jesus go if he were here in America? Where would Jesus go if you were here in America? Churches. That's right. This is our sin. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. So how does the shriveled hand shrivel look like? Uh, can't use it. Only one hand. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Uh, according to their tradition, on the Sabbath, you don't do any work. And they considered healing as work. Healing is work. Verse 11, he said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it up? That's work, right? If, if a sheep or even a cow falls into a, a, a pit, what do you do? You try to help it come out. That's a lot of work. And the Jews came up with a way to measure the amount of work that you can do on the Sabbath. In, in modern times, they say flipping on a switch is work. What? Flipping on a switch on the Sabbath is work. Cooking is work. You remember those days? Yeah? But Jesus said, look, if, if one of your animals falls into a pit on the Sabbath, what will you do? Help it, right? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Doing good is lawful on the Sabbath for Jesus. Even if it means that you have to do a lot of work. Verse 13, Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees, look at this. What did the Pharisees do? They went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Now, which, which one is wrong to do? To plot to kill someone or to heal someone? That's amazing. Did they even think about that? <laughs> so, it is lawful to heal and do good at any time. Whatever we're doing, you can always stop what we're doing and do good and help someone else. Right? If we can help someone here during service, praise the Lord. I want to tell you, if you have a feeling and you feel the Lord is telling you, go pray for someone to be healed during the service, go ahead. Don't let me stop you. Why should I stop you? Or why should any of our leaders stop you? you feel like God is leading you to go talk to someone and say, I'm sorry for what I did. Even during the sermon. It's fine. 
In fact, the scripture says, if you're there offering your gift before the altar, and there, remember, someone has something against you, what do you do? Leave it on the altar, and go get reconciled to that person. And after you get reconciled, go back and offer your gift. So what's more important to God? Mercy. Mercy is more important to God. Let's remember that. Mercy is more important to God. And that's what all religion has forgotten all these years. Can you imagine that during the time before the emancipation that they used the Bible to enslave people? Mercy is more important than sacrifice. Next month is going to be Black History Month. We need to talk about this. Because a lot of things are still going on in our society that doesn't help people. It doesn't help people. And we tend to uphold the rule of law before we even lift a hand to help other people. It is lawful to heal and do good at any time. That's our part. Jesus is not about rules, regulations, and traditions. Jesus is all about loving and serving people. Jesus is all about releasing people from the bondage of religion, from rules, from regulations, and tradition. And if there's a tradition that's good, hey, that's all right. But if the tradition steps on our toes and starts, you know, um, putting people in bondage, we need to get rid of that tradition. Right? The question we need to ask is, what traditions do we have that's preventing people from coming to Christ? What traditions do we have that's preventing Christians from exercising their gifts? to serve other people? This is a question that the whole body of Christ should ask. What traditions do we have that's preventing us from reaching out to our neighbor and sharing the love of God? without the approval of the pastor. Where do you find that in the scriptures? And in some churches you can't go to the service. Oh, we had this before. I remember one of our ministers back in the Philippines. First time he went to the church service, a Sabbath service. And he had long hair. He was a hippie. The deacon said, well, you can't come to service. Third, so you can't come to service. You got to cut your hair first. Now, that's an obvious bad tradition, right? But there are some that's not so obvious. You got to figure out those things out, too. We need to, you know, we need to let God determine what do we need to change? What's stopping people from coming to Jesus Christ? What are we doing that's stopping people from coming to Christ? I know what I did to my children that would have stopped them from coming to Christ. I'm glad they're not that far away. You know. Teenagers do individuate, so we can't do anything about that. But you know, and some teenagers are like, you know, they want to go with their parents. Some teenagers just want to leave. Some people, but but. but can we find ways? Can we change our traditions? Can we change our thoughts? Can we even change our theology to open up the gates of heaven so that people can come? I'm inviting you to just lay it all out before the Lord and see what He says. I'm not trying to put pinpoint on anything that we're doing. All I'm saying is, Let's lay it out before the Lord. Let's ask the Lord, what are we doing, God? What am I doing 
What are my thoughts and my traditions, my rules that stopping other people from coming to you? I want to set that aside. I want to have mercy rather than sacrifice. I want what you think. I want what what you want to say to me, Lord, and what you want to say to other people, and some of the things that maybe hinder us from being able to share the love of God is our fear that maybe they won't accept it. Or our fear that we'll get kicked out of the school system if we say something. Or our fear that this is against the law. Or my fear as a chaplain that I'll get kicked out as a chaplain if I start sharing the gospel. We gotta get rid of those rules and regulations. We have to step out and stick our neck out and, and just do what the Lord says. So I invite you, think about it this whole week. You know, just kneel before the Lord and say, Lord, what do you think? What do you want? I want to change. If I want to have a resolution this year, I want to be, I want to have your resolution for me. I want your resolution for me. I want your desire for me. I want your desire for Grace Communion Las Vegas. I want your resolution for Grace Communion Las Vegas. I want your desire for Las Vegas. And if I have fear, oh God, please remove that from me. Just cast it out. Cast out that fear, that darkness in my soul. And let me walk out in faith and encourage. Let me leave behind everything that stops me from coming closer to you and bringing others to Jesus Christ. Let me leave behind everything that's stopping others because of me. Because Jesus is not about rules or regulations or traditions. He's about loving and serving people. And you look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is about loving and and serving people. Amen. Amen. Right? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just come to you and we ask you, God, and you can just, Lord, open our eyes. Let us see what's wrong, what needs to be undone, because we've, we've done so many things that we know that it's not right before you. Things that are not your desire. Sacrifice rather than mercy. Lord, we want to be in your will. And your will is for us to be able to share your love with others. So God, we come to you. We ask you, oh God, open our eyes. Show us today. Show us today. This year, I dedicate 2016 to be a year when we would Look up to you and do what you want, O oh God. We desire your will. We desire mercy rather than sacrifice. Lord, we lift this up to you in Jesus' name.